for any other reason, it at least helps you know Rosie better. Um, I'm, I'm glad that Rosie asked for or suggested that this be a very specific topic in training because I think in the past, this has been an idea that I or others will reference as kind of a side note to another training topic. And I think it is worth having as its own, let's focus in and just define what we mean when we talk about this. Um, partially because there's all these different terms that gets thrown around uh, to talk about a very similar concept. But I'll just kind of spoiler alert, where I'm gonna finish is that I, I genuinely believe this is a career altering mindset. It doesn't come easily. You never arrive. So this isn't something that you listen to for 45 minutes and say, oh, cool, got it. Therefore, career altered. I think this is something where the more that you um, really try to exercise the discipline of having this as your mindset, the harder you realize it is, right? So this isn't something where you just get there. It's that as you learn it, the more you realize it isn't your default nature and is something that has to be developed. So um, I'd encourage you to not look at this as, oh, okay, I got it, or, oh, I already understand this, so this training isn't for me. Um, even as I was preparing for this morning, uh, as, as much as this has influenced me, and I, guys, I will say legitimately, this idea has changed my life. Like, I'm not overselling that. This has totally changed the way that I look at the world. But yet, as I was preparing for this, I realize how much my default is still to not think in terms of abundance. So I'll explain what I mean by that, but I just want to illustrate that I hope you're thinking about this concept as something that you will always have to work on for the rest of your life and in a really good way. So um, I'm going to share my screen and start with defining some terms. And um, I'll admit that a couple of these get a little bit uh, on the side of either kind of like economic nerd or math nerd or um, academic. But I, I want to try to be really clear about what we mean by this. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, if you have questions, I, I may not notice them right away, but as we go, just drop any questions you have into the chat. And then at the end, I'll make sure we come back to those and, and open it up at that point. Cool? Okay. Oops, that's not gonna work. Hang on. That work? Cool. Okay. So uh, we'll start out with the uh, super nerdy uh, zero sum fallacy. So for those that have ever taken an economics course that you didn't like, this might be triggering you right now. Um, econ was my favorite course in both high school and college. If I would go back to college, I would probably major in econ. So that tells you something about me, but um, the zero sum fallacy is really where this thinking starts. So to kind of understand abundance versus scarcity thinking, you have to understand what the zero sum fallacy is. So a uh, definition of zero sum fallacy is the idea that there is a fixed pie of some re resource and therefore if one person gets more, that means the other person gets less. So it's called zero sum as a math illustration. If you envision a formula where in, a, in order for the formula to balance, any impact that you do to one side of the formula has to be mirrored. So if one side of the formula gains some value, the other side has to lose the value so that the impact is a net zero. So kind of in English, this means your gain is my loss. So this is the zero sum fallacy is that in any resource, 
and resources intentionally generic. So we'll, we'll get to more of like, well, how does this apply? Um, maybe even a more academic, uh, this talks about zero sum as a social concept. So this is uh, where it gets really nerdy, but I think this is really interesting. A general belief system about the antagonistic nature of social relations shared by people in a society or culture and based on the implicit assumption that a finite amount of goods exist in the world. So in other words, that's, it's the finite, you cannot create more of it. So if you can't create more of it, that's what makes winners and losers. Like if one person is winning, the only way that that person can win is at someone else's expense. So it's using goods here instead of resources. Uh, the last sentence here, people who share this conviction believe that success, especially economic success, is possible only at the expense of other people's failures. So let that sink in for a moment. People who share this conviction believe that success, especially economic success, is possible only at the expense of other people's failures. Um, this is called the zero sum fallacy because generally it's not good economic thinking. This is not how economics tend to work. A couple little phrases that help to illustrate if someone is saying or thinking these things, they're kind of buying into this zero sum fallacy. Fixed pie is another way that people will often uh, describe this. In other words, the pie is fixed. If my piece of pie gets bigger, the only way that that can happen is that someone else's piece of the pie is getting smaller. Make sense? So for them to gain, I have to sacrifice. Or her win is my loss. Or his success is my failure. These are all zero sum fallacy ways of thinking. Another way of describing this is scarcity thinking. So the reason that so zero sum fixed pie scarcity in this conversation, these are all synonyms. Okay, so scarcity thinking, because if my starting point is that some resource is scarce, I'm assuming that the only way for me to get the scarce resource is for someone else not to get it, okay? Moving outside the world of academic a little bit, I wanna highlight three assumptions that I'm making in this conversation. Um, these may not be 100% true, but agree with me for the moment so that we can have the conversation. My first, assumption is that this perspective it just it invades every aspect of your life this isn't just about your real estate career because this is the most common default so whether or not you tend to think this way people around you certainly do right because it's it's very common so it's relationships money career success uh, anything you're going out to purchase uh, negotiations and even happiness. If you don't think of these resources in a scarcity mindset, congratulations, good on you. Uh, but I can assure you that friends, families, neighbors, coworkers are thinking this way. My second assumption is that you and anyone that thinks this way generally isn't aware of it. So in the moment, you're not aware that you're looking at something as a zero sum or fixed buy or, or scarce resource. So you're not consciously thinking, huh, is this resource scarce or is it abundant? And because you're not thinking that way, you default, we default to scarcity thinking. And so we don't generally see it for what it is. My third assumption is that it is generally not true. So just simply put, very few things are truly zero sum. Very few things are truly fixed by, very few things are truly scarce. 
certainly not the number of things that we default to believing. Um, I'll, I'll throw out uh, one notable exception uh, that a lot of times when I'm talking about this, if someone's going to ask a question, they will ask about time. Time is about the only significant resource that I would be willing to concede is truly fixed. You cannot create more time. Um, now, even when we're talking about time, I think that most people view time as a scarce resource and that's correct, but they're, I think, missing a step. So I don't wanna to get too deeply into this, uh, but for example, I think we make an assumption that you can only do one thing at any given moment with your time, but even time can be used abundantly because if you spend your time doing the right thing, you're actually investing in multiple resources, multiple areas of life. So I can explain more of what I mean by that, but I just want to acknowledge, I think outside of time, uh, any significant resource that we would look at is not truly scarce. It's abundant. Okay. So, those are my working assumptions. Uh, if you disagree with me on those, you're welcome to put that in the chat and I'll try to come back to it. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of scarcity thinking in real estate just to kind of illustrate that what do we default to? And this, I'm not trying to preach about this. I, just, I, I wanna be honest and say, even as much as this has impacted my life, like I still have gut reactions that are scarce in their thinking, okay? Um, and I actually think the, the more impactful this has been in my life, the more often I realize this is the case, that this is my reaction, not less. Um, I think the easiest example is negotiation. And this, this is clearly the way that most people think about negotiation, um, is that we're negotiating for some scarce resource, um, but, Negotiation should almost always be thought about in terms of creating value, not fighting for a fixed set of value. I, several years ago, if you, you know, a few of you have heard me mention this, several years ago I took a in-person CE class that to this day was still uh, by a wide margin the best CE class I've ever taken. Uh, I, I think the uh, abbreviation was I, I became a certified negotiation expert, a CNE from having taken this course, which is funny. Uh, the lesson of that course, the one particular session that I thought was the most interesting, this company that ran it had done a lot of research on different negotiation styles and they had categorized people as either win-lose negotiators or win-win negotiators. And so uh, win-lose negotiator is someone that comes into a negotiation viewing any gain that they can accomplish as a loss for the other side. That's just the, how it works, right? Someone's going to lose. And generally a win-lose thinker is someone's going to lose and I, it will not be me. I'm going to win. So then the other person has to lose. Okay, uh, a win-win thinker tends to approach negotiation looking for outcomes where everyone involved gets something better than what they started with. That's a win. I walked away with something better than what I started with. That's a win. And a win-win thinker assumes that in negotiations, that's always possible. There was this fascinating study that this company had done on what are the projected outcomes when you have a win-win thinker with a win-win thinker, when the two agents both think that way, versus if one is win-win, one is win-lose, or if both of them are win-lose, and you could guess what, the, uh, what category had the highest percentage of mutual releases, um, and it, it's just funny, like, like a lot of times I think we're looking at mutual releases as outcomes from the buyer and seller. And this company, their research was fascinating. Um, I'll see if I could locate it. Essentially, they, they convinced me that the 
uh, the best correlation for a mutual release was not buyer and seller attitude. It was when you have two win-lose agents up against each other. Because if they both think someone has to lose, you just radically increase the odds of a mutual release during particularly inspections. So that's what happens if two win-lose thinkers come up against each other. Oops. Um, and I think something to keep in mind here about negotiations, and this is just a, a helpful way to think about scarcity versus abundance. Why is everybody at the table in the first place in a negotiation? Think about this for a second. Think about anyone in a real estate transaction. Obviously, you have the buyer and the seller. The buyer has money and they want a house. The seller has a house and they want money. The realtors have a service that they provide. They have experience, knowledge, time, emotional energy. They want paid. Title company, lender, home inspector, throw all the parties in. The reason that they're all at the table is that they, everyone has a resource that they want to trade. Otherwise, they wouldn't be at the table. And if that's your starting point, that everyone has a resource that they want to trade for some resource that the other person has, it doesn't guarantee success. But if that's, if your assumption is that everybody is at the table because they have a resource that they want to trade for a resource that someone else at the table has, well, there you have a situation where you can have an abundant negotiation because everyone walks away with something more desirable to them than what they had at the start. I mean, it sounds basic, right? You, I mean, we hear that and we're like, well, duh. But we lose sight of that. We, for sure, I can, I can point to many examples where I lose sight of that um, the best example I can get, or the best example I can think of is the uh, painful inspection response. For whatever reason, that's the one that causes me to lose sight of this fastest. Maybe it's something different for you guys. Um, I may be in price negotiation, but I think where I, my mind and heart goes into scarcity thinking the fastest is when I get an inspection response that annoys me. So just being real, um, I think what maturing in the industry looks like is being able to process through that faster to get back to, okay, how can I think abundantly about this even if the other party is not? Um, second example from our industry, uh, sharing information and helping each other. Uh, for those of you that have worked in other industries, um, I think it's fair to say that our industry is notoriously bad at this. I think our company is actually really good at this, by the way. But just as an industry, it's not our norm to share information and help each other. Why? I think it's because we view there to be a number of resources that are fixed and sharing information is going to a lot more of those resources to someone else. Um, this is very closely related to how we view other people's success. And just honest question, what internal feelings do you experience when you see another person succeed? And I, you don't have to answer, more of kind of an internal processing question. You're welcome to if you want. But just kind of an honest self-reflection, right? If, if we think we are truly abundant thinkers, this is a good test. When you see another person succeed, particularly if it might be someone who succeeds in a different way than we do or is quote unquote more successful than we are 
Uh, we view them as a competitor. What internal feelings do we experience when we see another person's success? Um, you know, I started, <laughs> I was going to say, I started a company that will remain nameless in our industry. Most of you know where I started, and it would take you about five seconds to figure it out by <laughs> jumping under the BLC. I'll let you do that if you want. Um, great company, full of very, very nice people. I, I still know a number of people in the company and, and uh, to, to a T. Everyone that I have known, several of you, by the way, I think we have probably six or seven, at least, agents that used to work in this company. Um, to a T, everyone that I know there is very, very nice. It took me a couple months to get my arms around the general feeling that the agents in the company had toward each other. And it wasn't unkind, it wasn't unprofessional, it wasn't vicious, but it was scarce in its thinking. Everything was scarce. Expertise, relationships, territory, uh, you know, market share, geography, leads, uh, vendor relationships, marketing tools, like the list goes on. The general perspective was that everything was scarce and that informed how information was handled, how relationships were handled, how uh, we viewed each other's success. Um, and it always kind of left me wanting something different. So the alternative, so I've, I've kind of been using three ways to explain this same concept. So zero sum, scarcity, um, and uh, fixed pie. So kind of using all three of those. The opposite of scarcity is abundance. The opposite of fixed pie is growth. The opposite of zero sum is value creation. Okay. Where of these three works the best in your mind, you can kind of latch onto that version. And if it's scarcity, it's that, oh, there isn't a scarce amount of that resource. There is an abundant amount. There's more than we need. That pie isn't fixed. It can actually grow. The sum of the formula does not have to be zero. You can actually create or add value. Okay. I, and I, I think that the more that you can embrace this shift in thinking, I genuinely believe it can change your career. Um, and I don't think it's overstated to say that it can change the way you experience life. Um, no, it's like, geez, Monday morning, nine o'clock training session, trying to dive in and get all, all like philosophical and deep. Uh, so I appreciate y'all bearing with me, but um, I, I will, I'm a testament to this myself. Uh, I think this has radically changed the way that I experience life, the more that I embrace this. Um, a slide here that comes from um, another individual that I think is really helpful, uh, just to kind of give you a side-by-side -side, uh, couple quotes. So uh, read down through this with me. Uh, a scarcity thinker says there will never be enough when an abundance thinker says there will always be more. Scarcity competes to stay on top. Abundant thinker collaborates to stay on top. Uh, scarcity will hoard. That's a natural reaction. If the resource is truly scarce, you'll hoard. If the resource is truly abundant, you'll be generous. Won't share knowledge versus shares knowledge won't offer to help versus freely offers to help. Scarcity is suspicious. Uh, abundant defaults to trust. A uh, little note there that a scarcity thinker always fears being taken advantage of. Abundant thinker doesn't worry about it. What's, what's that loss? If, okay, so what I was taken advantage of, there's more. It was worth it, right? Um, scarcity resents competition while abundant welcomes it. Uh, ab abundant thinking actually views competition as healthy and productive because it helps us grow. 
it ensures that we're doing the best we can. So a, a, a scarcity thinker resents competition because they're afraid of being replaced. An abundant thinker welcomes it because they're striving to grow. Scarcity believes times are tough. Abundant believes the best is yet to come. Again, related to if the pie is shrinking or fixed, times are always tough. But if the pie is growing, the best is yet to come. So scarcity will think small, avoid risks, uh, fear of failure, fear of change. Abundant will think big, embraces risk, uh, uh, and change is a good thing because things are growing, not shrinking. I know there's a lot there. Don't, don't view this as something that you have to kind of get your arms all the way around. My goal is throw enough of this out there that maybe one or two of these is something that your mind can latch onto. That you can grasp and say, oh, okay, I get that. That, that particular example helps me understand scarcity versus abundance. So I wanna give you a couple examples to the positive side now that, um, and I'm going to finish by suggesting some resources. Again, this isn't something that you arrive at. You don't see these examples and think, oh, awesome. I, I now understand what abundance thinking in real estate looks like. Because here's the thing. You can understand this mentally. You could read these three examples I'm going to give and say, oh, I get that. I could see how that would be beneficial. And I can guarantee you, you're all going to be in the middle of a negotiation next week. And if we could hit pause and kind of pull you out of the negotiation and say, are you thinking abundantly or scarcely? We're all going to be able to find a way in which we were thinking scarcely. So I'm going to give you the examples. Hopefully they're helpful, but don't view these as having uh, like arrived at the concept. I think this is something where you have to form your thinking over and over and over, okay? Like, I'm asking for permission uh, to share the examples that y'all won't kind of latch onto them too tightly. Um, so going back to negotiation, the better we do as agents in negotiation, the better all of our outcomes will be. So under this framework, I'd rather work with a good negotiator on the other side. See, I'm defining the word good. If negotiation can be a win-win, I don't want a bad negotiator on the other side. I want a good one. I want two people that can approach this thinking win-win, therefore, increasing the likelihood that my client and their client truly get to exchange the resource they have to receive the resource they want. And yes, primarily this is house for money, right? But there's plenty of other variables um, that go into how can you find a win-win, a mutually beneficial outcome one of the things that I remember somebody talking about that um, if a real estate transaction closes, it is by definition a mutually beneficial transaction. Um, and I know a lot of times people at the closing table, <laughs> they may not feel like it was mutually beneficial, right? A, a buyer or a seller can be at the closing table and feel like they just really got beat up. But yet I think it's a fair question. Why are they there? If it was not beneficial to them, they may not have enjoyed it. Um, and they may feel like the other side got a better value. But if they're at the table and signing, it's because they were willingly trading one resource for another. So going back to this idea of what happens when two win-win thinkers come together, negotiations, they may not always be smooth, but it is highly likely that the deal happens, regardless of buyer and seller position. I don't think we give ourselves enough credit as agents for our impact on the transaction. 
Um, when two win-win thinkers are together, it's very unlikely that a release happens. Um, again, coming back to why is everyone at the table, we can always find ways to add value that appeals to the resource that that person's looking for. Um, abundance thinking in terms of helping each other, uh, I, this is something y'all are, are really good at. Um, and, and we will always challenge you towards this. I, I challenge myself towards this. A dangerous sharing of information. Dangerous meaning I'm willing to overshare. I'm, I'm willing to not have this relationship be truly reciprocal. That's dangerous, right? It's vulnerable. And I mean, this is any relationship in life. I'm willing to share enough that at the end of some time measure, this wasn't really a reciprocal relationship. I gave more than I got. That's dangerous. It's vulnerable. So in the sharing of information and helping someone, are you willing to be dangerous in the sharing of the information? Because what happens if everyone in the culture is willing to be dangerous in the sharing of information or another resource, perhaps it's time or encouragement. Information is a pretty big one in our industry. But if everyone in the culture is willing to be dangerous in that sharing of information, what happens to the pie? Well, it's no longer fixed. That the definition of reciprocal isn't equal exchange. It's not, I gave you two units of value, therefore you gave me two units of value. It's I was willing to share two units of value with you with an open hand, not holding tightly to the result. And what's going to end up happening is that both of our pies grew by three units. Nerdy economic language there, but uh, I think this is best illustrated within a, a company or an office in the like, what happens when the newer agent wants to ask a question? What does the culture say about that agent's desire to ask a question of a more experienced agent. So kind of outside the realm of academia, just saying like, is that person, have they been subconsciously or implicitly communicated to that they shouldn't ask? Or is the general consensus, not nah, everybody around me is willing to be dangerous, dangerously generous in the sharing of their time and resource. And now all of a sudden, I'm gonna be encouraged to do that. And I'm gonna find ways to add value to other people. This is abundance thinking really well illustrated. And I, guys, I gotta tell you, we're in an industry where, partially because our industry sucks at this, <laughs> um, we have a really great opportunity. I mean, I, generally, there are other industries where this is more the norm. In ours, because it's not the norm, I think it gives our company a really great opportunity, um, not just to have a more enjoyable workplace, but to have a more productive workplace. This is not just generosity for the sake of generosity, um, which I I, is a worthwhile thing. I'm actually talking about generosity for the sake of abundant production. Um, perspective on others' success, again, as a good kind of checkpoint, like how are we doing? Am I thinking abundantly or scarcely? Um, I'm going to go over our company values here, but this, and this is referenced in that, uh, how can we celebrate good work wherever we see it? Um, again, I think just kind of an internal reference point when we see or, or experience other people succeeding, do we celebrate that? Um, and I think what growth in abundance mindset looks like is uh, like a scarcity thinker, 
sees another person's success, they're probably jealous. Uh, they want to find a way to explain it away, right? Well, here's here's why that happened, right? It wasn't wasn't anything good, right? Uh, or they want to say, I'm going to define my success based upon that person. That's scarcity thinking. And, and trust me, I do all three of these things. And then the way that you talk about it reflects that, right? Well, I think of growth looks like having that as your internal reaction and then calling attention to it. Oops. Um, did I lose you guys for a second? Great. Go back to sharing my screen then. My computer froze and so I thought maybe I'd lost you. Hang on. <laughs> now I'm having screen sharing problems. There we go. So now I'm gonna have to go all the way through this. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, where I was uh, there a moment ago was that I think growth in this doesn't look like immediately changing your default reaction. Your default reaction is your default reaction. Internally, you're going to have this reaction. I think growth looks like challenging your own response, asking questions of yourself to say, wait a minute, what, like, why am I responding that way? What perspective or what philosophy is causing me to respond that way? And then maybe get a perspective from somebody else or I just kind of sit with it for a minute and say like, what's the outcome? If, if that's my philosophy or default thinking, where does that land me? Well, partially it lands you in never being satisfied, um, but I also think it will limit your own potential, right? So it's just a good reference point or a good measure in terms of how you're doing and not for the sake of beating yourself up. That's not the goal. Um, the goal is to carve out room for growth by recognizing scarcity thinking, you can make it more likely that your default becomes abundant thinking. Um, I want to highlight our company vision, mission, and values uh, because I think this, so you can see where this thinking is kind of ingrained in who we are as a company. And I just, these are aspirational. These are not self-righteous, okay? This is not a, we do not do this perfectly. This is not looking down our nose at anybody else. This is what we aspire to, and we will never get to a point where this is 100% reality, okay? So I wanna be very clear on that. Our company vision statement is that we are a client-focused real estate brokerage serving the Circle City. Um, focused on clients serving the city, right? Uh, abundance thinking defaults to the other person's needs. Our mission is to create value for our clients, teammates, and neighborhoods through excellent service and a culture of collaboration. You see it twice there. Create value. Not grasp, uh, not control. I believe that good service in our industry actually creates value uh, through a culture of collaboration is the second. Um, collaboration by definition is abundance thinking. That's, that's the concept. Uh, our company values, you'll see this thinking a couple times here. 
uh, excellence, service and expertise so that our clients have a great experience start to finish. People, prioritize relationships over transaction and be generous with our resources. Um, again, this is not simply generosity for the sake of generosity, um, which, I, I, hey, I, I think is a worthwhile thing, like I said earlier. Uh, but in the context of a real estate brokerage, you actually don't need generosity to be the end game, to be generous. Um, generosity comes with positive outcomes. Um, honesty and forthrightness in all aspects of our work. Um, again, reflecting abundance thinking is being willing to be honest and have integrity even when it doesn't serve your short-term interests. So scarcity thinking is what will cause shady behavior. Because if you view the pie as fixed, well, then you're, you're looking to gain however much of the pie you can. And if being dishonest gives you a larger portion of that, then you're going to be willing to do it. Um, but I think abundance thinking encourages honesty and integrity. Uh, commitment to constant improvement and innovation. Um, again, we never arrive. There's always more value to be created. Uh, set proper boundaries and work in life. This has been a big one for me. Um, I think to think about uh, opportunities never stop. That's been a really helpful concept for me to set better boundaries in life, that opportunities never stop. They never cease presenting themselves. So in other words, if I feel like the opportunities are going to dry up, I'm probably going to end up working as much as possible. And I've been there. Whereas if I view the opportunities as abundant, I'm willing to say no or to stop work to experience other values in life because I know there will always be more opportunities. Do you see that? that scarcity thinking actually can lead to an unhealthy uh, work-life balance. Um, civic pride, we advocate for our city by supporting good work wherever we see it. Um, Y'all, this is I just kind of a self-reflection self here as I was thinking about this. Um, I have a lot of civic pride. I enjoy celebrating good work. If I'm totally honest, I am too slow to celebrate good work in our industry when it's outside of Black Collective. That's hard for me. I'm a competitive person by nature. Um, I think I'm better at this than I used to be, but I have a lot of room to grow. Uh, by Do I believe that supporting good work in our industry, regardless of where it comes from, uh, is the like the best course of action. Yes, I do. Do I always do that? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I have been called a nerd by Rosie, which is fair. <laughs> I think Natalie was responding to, did I lose you guys for a moment? Thank you, Natalie. Um, I've ended with about 10 minutes left. Uh, I would love to answer questions. Um, I, I, I'm going to go back to my screen and share some resources kind of as a finishing point. But before I do that, uh, no, uh, Dave, please do. Um, Rosie, maybe uh, after the call, if you would send out uh, our company mission and vision and values. Uh, yeah, Dave, I think it'd be great to use. Yeah, I can send out your whole slide deck, Mark, if you send it over to me. Um, Mark, I also had a question, like outside of real estate, um, I know you said that this relates to um, like personal relationships and really in all areas of life. I'm curious, like, how have you seen this play out in some of your more like significant relationships? Like, with Josh or with Sarah or um, maybe even your kids? Like, what does that look like for you? <laughs> for those of you that 
have a significant other, I'm just going to go ahead and say that I think your significant other is probably the most challenging circumstance in, in most cases to have uh, constantly abundant thinking because I think that's where you're going to experience the most pressure on this idea. Um, yeah, let me give you uh, two examples. So I, I referenced earlier time. Um, I have really valued getting involved in like organizations or just kind of missions around the city that I think are positively impacting the city. And I, at one point viewed those, I, I was thinking in terms of scarcity and I, I was more likely to say no because I was, I was viewing it in a bucket, right? Like, oh, this is in a particular category as opposed to, huh, here's an opportunity where if I say yes to this, not only do I get to help the mission of this organization, but I'm going to become a better business owner, a better realtor, a better dad, a, a better husband. If I'm doing this, it will uh, leverage itself. So I think abundantly looking at that, that um, it will improve my relationships because it grows me as a person. Um, I also think, uh, I, I've heard someone say in a very uh, close relationship, if you are viewing the relationship that each of you need to put in 50%, um, you're just, you're always going to be frustrated. Um, you actually both probably need to put in about 75% where, where like you're constantly in that position of like vulnerability and dangerous sharing of resources. Maybe that's emotional. Maybe that's like seeking reconciliation. I mean, there's all sorts of examples of this where you feel like you're going more than halfway. But if you both constantly feel like you're going more than a patient uh, is, well, there's a, a much more optimistic possible outcome. If you both feel like you're going more than halfway, and y'all know this, right? I mean, I'm generally any human really more than halfway. That's about as close as I'm gonna to get to marriage advice. I'm not qualified to give it. <laughs> I can assure you I'm not. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump back to my screen for a moment and uh, share a couple of resources. If somebody has a question, uh, feel free to post that. I'm gonna share, hang on. Oops, now I'm gonna have to go back to my slideshow again, sorry. Um, so my last slide here just shares a couple of resources and if y'all haven't heard me beat this horse dead before, I'm gonna do it now. Um, these are three books that I just, I am convinced you could not read or listen to these books too many times. And I think if you're in it, if you are in this industry and have not consumed these resources somehow, do it. Like, I, I don't know of a better use of your time. I, I genuinely believe this. Um, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, uh, habits four and five of the seven, pretty much nail this concept. And I, some people think that Stephen Covey actually coined the phrase abundance. Um, he wrote the seven habits. He's the first one to think of this concept. This has been around for millennia, but he does a really good succinct job of summarizing this uh, particularly in habits four and five. So if you don't want to consume the whole thing, it's basically two chapters. So I encourage that. Um, 
how to win friends and influence people. I'm telling y'all, you're like, oh my gosh, Mark is always preaching about this book. And many of you have probably read it years and years ago. Uh, go read it again. Go listen to it. You can buy it on Audible and listen to it at like one and a half speed and it doesn't take that long. Um, the general concept of this book is you only get in the long run, you only get what you want in life by finding out what other people want and giving it to them first. So I think the whole book illustrates what it means to be dangerously generous with your resources, that it is not a one-to-one -one exchange. That's the wrong concept. Um, Stephen Covey and Dale Carnegie, pretty decent people to take advice from, at least in this category. Um, I'm not quite as high on the third one. It's, it's a great resource. I, I'd encourage you to read it. But if me suggesting three makes it less likely that you consume any of them, ignore the third one <laughs> and focus in on one and two. Uh, but Never Eat Alone, is, it's a more recent book um, that I thought was really valuable. It, it's like a rethinking of this concept of networking that you, you don't build a network by seeking value. You build a network by adding value. That every interaction you have, your aim is what does this person need and how could I help them achieve it? And stop, period, done. Not how could I help them achieve it so that they could help me achieve my aim, just simply, Building a network is seeking to add value to every interaction you have, period. It's a really great concept and I appreciated the book. When you feel like you're an expert on the first two, you can go to the third one, how's that? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, Natalie, I think it's a great, Natalie has asked uh, if you have a very difficult agent or client, you want to, try and call and get things back on track. What do you say? Um, this is kind of like where the rubber meets the road, right? Is uh, thinking, win-win thinking is generally easy if the other side is thinking the same way. Um, when they get into the very much kind of win-lose scarcity thinking, how do you respond? Um, ask questions, listen. Um, so, we, we had a, a training last year where we I was talking about inspection responses. Um, Y'all, this is not me preaching. This is me like preaching to myself maybe. Uh, when you get that really challenging inspection response, call and say, um, hey, thanks for sending that inspection response. Number one, thanks for sending that, even though everything inside of you is saying that you don't deserve me saying thank you for sending this, start by saying thank you, and then ask questions. Hey, um, just before I present this to my seller, um, of the 23 things that you have on this inspection response, maybe don't say 23, of the things that you have on this response, could you just um, help me get your buyer's perspective and which of them is the most important? Like, can you just help me, help me understand where their highest priority is? Which ones do they feel the most weighty about you're not saying no to anything you're asking questions just to try to understand what is the resource in this case maybe it's an inspection item what's the resource that they want the most and you start to try to rank them in your mind um ask question listen ask question listen ask question listen the more unreasonable the other person is, the harder this is to do. And you have to buy into the fact that I'm going to ask questions and do nothing but listen for the sake of my client, for the sake of the transaction. I find this much harder to do with a client than I do another realtor. I, I struggle when I'm, when I have a client that is thinking very much win lose, uh, that is a battle. You, you need to ask Jess Martin how to do that. I got nothing for you. <laughs> I feel like I'm pretty good with another realtor. And when, I, when my client is like this, um, 
I'm, I may be a little bit more quick to be like, I, this isn't working, I'm out. Like, I'm exaggerating a little. Um, Natalie, I hope that's helpful. I mean, I, I think in general, um, be very slow to state the resource that matters to you because they don't care. They don't care. It doesn't matter how much it matters to you. It doesn't matter how much leverage you have. They don't care how much you want it. They care how much they want the resource they want. And if you ask and listen very slowly, the likelihood that they're willing to grant the thing that you want goes up. And it doesn't even matter if they know what it is. Uh, Rosie, that's a great question. When you generously give your resources, how do you ensure that you don't dry yourself up and wear yourself out? Um, so, all right, uh, disclaimer, half of you are going to hear this answer and say, oh, okay, sure, someone of Mark's extroverted personality can say this. Um, I do not experience generosity drying me out. It's the opposite. The more generous I am, the easier it is to be generous the next time. I, I think it's actually being um, kind of playing it safe or being conservative with generosity is what causes me to dry out. Um, so <laughs> quarantine's hard for, uh, <laughs> for someone of my personality. But yeah, uh, I, I think the, uh, the more times you're willing to be dangerously generous, the easier it will be to do it in the future, not the harder it will be. I mean, and I, you have to, you know, set good boundaries. I, like guys, I'm not suggesting that you become foolish or naive or, you know, expose yourself to dangerous circumstances. I mean, I like, that's a very different thing. Boundaries still very, very important. Um, but generally, uh, we, we think about like the boundary of protecting our resources, I think incorrectly most of the time. Um, okay, I was committed to 10, it's 10.01. <laughs> Uh, thank you everyone for hearing my philosophical treatise. Uh, Rosie will send the slide deck. Um, I encourage you if, if any of you choose to kind of dive deeper and want to have more conversation about this, uh, let me know. I am, I am game, um, phone call whenever we're able to get coffee together, like, I love this topic and I, I think I grow every time I talk to somebody about it. So take me up on that. Thanks, Mark. That was amazing. Appreciate it. Um, guys, if you can join tomorrow, we have Laura Schlaefer from Reflect Interiors joining us. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about staging, particularly how um, to make your client's house maybe more visually appealing with what they have um, inside their house. So, um, yeah. Hope you can join. Have a good one. Thanks, everybody.